Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Welcome to the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Brian Elaine and Adam Thomas. Brian leads Writing for Your Life, a resource center and conference for spiritual writers, which includes the Publishing and Color Conference series intended to increase the number of books published by spiritual writers of color. Brian also leads the team that produces Compassionate Christianity and How to Heal Our Divides. Previously, Brian served as founding director of the Frederick Beekner Center, where he led the launch of Mr. Beekner's online presence and established several new programs and strategic partnerships. Brian has an MBA from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was designated a Palmer Scholar, the highest academic award. Also with us today is Adam Thomas. Adam wears many hats, pastoring an Episcopal church in southeastern Connecticut, editing and designing books for independent writers, writing fantasy novels, podcasting about Jesus and nerding stuff, nerdy stuff, and playing lots of Dungeons and Dragons. Adam published four books in a curricula with Abingdon Press from 2011 to 2014, and when his twins were born in 2014, he switched to writing fantasy. You can find hundreds of his sermons on wherethewind.com, wherethewind.com, several fantasy novels at adamthomas.net, And his podcast, the podcast for Nerdy Christians, is at nerdychristians.com or wherever you download your podcasts. So together, Adam and Brian co-edited the book, How to Heal Our Divides, a project aimed at building awareness of organizations that are taking real action to address these issues that are dividing us. The project is not an attempt to gloss over serious problems or to make happy, quote unquote, but instead to highlight tangible efforts that are solving problems, actually healing divides in effective and practical ways. So welcome to the show, Brian and Adam. Hey, there. Good day. Good to thanks be for here. having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, let's start, Adam. What else would you like our listeners to know about you? Well, I mentioned in my bio that I play a lot of Dungeons & Dragons. I actually have, I think, four games going right now. Wow. Uh, and most of the novels that I write take place in the fantasy world that I created for my Dungeons & Dragons games. And uh, they're a lot of fun to write, and uh, hopefully they're fun to read if uh, people actually read them. <laughs> Interesting. Brian, uh, how about you? Well, I think for me it's that I've only been doing what I'm doing for a few years. Um, most of my life was completely different focus on high tech and things like that. And so, you know, I turned 60 almost five years ago now. And at that point in time said, what do I want to do the rest of my life? And that's <laughs> when I started doing writing for your life, which led to publishing in color and compassionate Christianity and, and now how to heal our bites. Awesome. Uh, Adam, share a little bit about your faith journey if you can. Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, as you said in the bio, I am uh, an Episcopal priest. I've been a priest for a little over 13 years. I was ordained about as young as you can be uh, as a priest at at age 25. And um, I I like to tell people that I think I became a priest. I think God called me to be a priest because I would have made a pretty lousy layperson. I I think I would have been a pretty... uh, I'm kind of in awe of of lay people and and how committed they are to the church. And I don't think I would have been that committed if I had been a lay person. And so being a a member of the clergy has uh, kept me uh, focused on my life of faith in a way that I don't think I would have been otherwise. Hmm. Wow. 13 years of ordination. Wow. Congratulations there. Uh, Brian, how about you? Well, um... You know, I guess I'd consider myself a real Christian or whatever since uh, around high school. You know, hmm. I went to school and church, all that kind of stuff before that, but, you know, it was because I had to, uh, you know. And uh, by the time I became, you know, uh, in sophomore year of high school, I kind of decided, okay, well, this stuff makes sense to me. And, mm-hmm. really, you know, I want to um, be more involved, so to speak. So um, I've been members of a variety of different denominations. You know, I had Methodist, UCC. Um, 
I've been a member of the Reformed Church of America, which is what used to be the Dutch Reformed Church yeah. for many years now, just because of having moved to New Jersey and um, lived in a community where those denominational churches are more um, prevalent. There's just quite a few of them around. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been an elder, deacon, you know, things like that, pretty heavily involved in my church. But, um, you know, most of my high-tech life, um, you know, I was consumed with raising a family and trying to keep whatever business it was that I was responsible for afloat. So I guess I was just much less involved, so to speak, in hmm. Christianity in a serious way beyond just my individual church. And what's that faith look like for you today then? Well, um, you know, I've hopefully grown and matured a little bit just like everybody else. Um, I think I'm a little bit more open-minded than I used to be. Hmm. I think I'm a little bit more empathetic than I used to be to other people. I'm for sure more of an activist or an advocate, hmm. yeah. uh, you know, on many different kinds of social justice issues, you know, than I used to be. So um, I didn't have like, you know, one of these kinds of experiences where I, you know, so many people you read about, they grew up in the very fundamentalist, you know, world, yeah. and then had this kind of like, reckoning you know of, of uh, that didn't work for them so they you know didn't know what to do or drastically change it i didn't really go through that you know um nearly to the degree at least uh, that a lot of those folks have but just a more gradual evolution i guess you know of my own thinking and understanding mm -hmm. yeah, you can't rub shoulders with folks like frederick Buechner and brian mclaren and diana butler bass and parker palmer without having their kind of worldview of christianity rub off on you yeah yeah. You know what I found is that when I first started reading them, I said to myself, well, finally, you know, I'm reading something that really resonates with me. Hmm. You know, I've been kind of thinking these kinds of things loosely in my, not very well formed, yeah. you know, the back of my mind. And then when I started reading Beacon, because he was the first one of all that group that you mentioned that I started reading. I said, holy cow, you know, hmm. I finally found my home. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, I think you have this author on your website. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore, but. Marcus Borg is one who I'd say like saved my faith reading his his book The Heart of Christianity. You're yeah. not alone there. Yeah. Um, I did some work with 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 the Marcus Borg Foundation and uh, I've had several people tell me the exact same thing. Hmm. Interesting. Uh Adam, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm doing some quick math in my head. Uh we're around the same age, so I'm kind of envious of your career success here, but uh what year graduated? What year did you graduate high school then? 2000 2001. Okay, I'm class of 2000. So, okay, yeah. uh, we both came of age. We both came of age during the the school shooting generation. Oh man, isn't that the yeah. truth? I don't know about, about you, but for me, I think Columbine was definitely the yeah the, uh, the biggest event during high school for me. Well, I went to. I mean, I I live in Colorado now, and I went to school in Colorado. You know, I was in high school during that time, and yeah, absolutely. So you were you were way closer than I was. I was in Alabama. Yeah, I knew some. Yeah, I knew some guys who went to went to Columbine, uh, so it was pretty pretty interesting. Um, to share about just a, a, a faith practice or spiritual practice that's been meaningful for y'all, or you might recommend to others. Sure, I do. Um, I, I I do silent prayer every morning. Uh, I sit for fifteen to twenty minutes. I don't. I used to time myself doing it, but I think at at that point, um, I would sort of be thinking in my head. When you're not supposed to be thinking about anything, I was thinking about when is the timer going to go <laughs> um, Yeah. After, say, a year or two years of doing this, um, my body kind of just knew when 15 to 20 minutes had happened. Hmm. And I was able to come back out of that prayer space. And, and for me, the silent meditation, um, because my life is so full of words, mm -hmm. the silent meditation is such an amazing practice for me because it's, it's a place where I can be devoid of words and just try to practice the presence of God in those few minutes. And um, that's been life-saving. Before that, I did a lot of 
uh, Ignatian journaling. Um, then my kids were born and um, that practice fell away because I had babies and I couldn't, I never really had the right schedule to be able to journal. Yeah. Um, and, and when a spiritual practice starts becoming a, a burden as opposed to something you you look forward to doing, yeah, um, you might not want to do a spiritual practice every day and you still do it. But once it becomes like a burden, you start stressing out because you're not doing it. Hmm. That's the time where you need to let a spiritual practice go and lie fallow for a time. And so I switched over to silent meditation and it and it fit so much better, in, at least in this season of my life. And I would highly recommend it. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good lesson right there. Uh, Brian, how about you? Well, uh, so, you know, I'm an engineer at the end of the day. That's what I grew up, you know, so I, I have a much different story for that. For me, it's reading. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Without a doubt, reading, because that's where I learn things. Mm -hmm. That's where I get more insights. And so um, luckily, I can do that as part of my day job, basically, because I do so many interviews of other authors um, and I'm so interested now in, you know, how folks are pushing the envelope for all of us in terms of learning about social justice issues and reparations and how do we make this country a better place than what it's become. I mean, so I'm very heavily, as, as much as I can, while I'm still doing all my other things, trying to, you know, read as much as I can. Because hmm. That's what really is so enriching for me. Awesome. I'm Thanks. glad you named reading as a spiritual practice. Yeah, me too. I mean, I don't know how many people would consider it. Maybe a lot of people probably wouldn't. You know, it's more things like prayer or meditation or what have you. But yeah. I mean, that just isn't me. I mean, it's not that I don't pray. Of course I do. But I mean, it's not, I don't know. <laughs> Everyone's just got different personalities, right? And different yeah. things that are more meaningful for them. Yeah, and I think, again... My writing fantasy novels are uh, is, is a spiritual direction for me, too, because it's about practicing the creativity that God gave me. And even though I'm not writing specifically about Jesus and when I'm writing fantasy, I'm still discovering things about myself as I write. And I'm trying to improvise as I'm writing characters and it really supports my life of faith in a way that is that seems tangential to following Christ, but really is at the heart of what we're doing because what we're doing is partnering with God in a creative way. Hmm. And I think that that's the way an author, an author's relationship to his or her characters is a lot like God's relationship to us. And, and that's me practicing that is, is another spiritual discipline. This is unrelated to our main topic, but I'm curious, Adam, like, would you say, like, being creative? I don't know. I've been thinking about that, like, is being creative, is it speak to kind of who, I, I obviously, well, I don't know, would, I, I would say, like, most, some people wouldn't say we're, we're, we're not creative, but it, couldn't we also say everyone is creative in their own way? And could you say, like, being creative is... I don't know engendering, engendering your spirit as it is, and then in yeah. that sense, of spiritual practice. Well, the way that I would look at it is that, uh, from a theological standpoint, uh, we believe that our God is a creative God. Mm -hmm. That's uh, the the seven days of creation in the Book of Genesis is about God creating. So we we talk about God as the creator. We also say that we are made in the image and likeness of God. The image that we're made in, the way that I take that meaning, is not image, not as in God looks like us. Yeah. But image as in the sense that we can imagine in a way that God imagines. There's an imagination, an imagined quality of God's creativity. I mean, look at uh, some of the animals that roam the earth, right? Um, but we also have a create. When we tap into our own creativity, we are living into the image of God. Hmm. And in the Holy Spirit, uh, in a Christian uh, Trinitarian understanding, one of the ways that we look at the Holy Spirit is as this creative force. Yeah. That that the creative that the, the Holy Spirit inspires us in in ways to be creative. So Interesting. Any, anytime anybody is acting in a creative uh, outlet, they are tapping into the image of God inside them. Hmm. This is this is a nice little conversation. Um, well, I'd love to continue on this theme, but we do have other things to talk about, and I know Brian has a schedule here he's got to get to. So, uh, Brian, you said it. You know, you're. you're you're interested in how to make this country a better place. And I, I'm assuming part of that, part of that process, part of that work towards that is this book that you and Adam co-edited called how to heal our divides, a practical guide. Um, so I guess first talk about just kind of how this came to be. Yeah, I'll start. And then Adam can talk more about, you know, once we got into kind of the production mm -hmm. segment of it, but 
the, there were two things that drove that for me that happened last year. <clears throat> One was that because of the pandemic, I was doing all kinds of online interviews. Like yeah. This. I was interviewing lots of authors, activists, et cetera. And I always felt like, okay, after the election, I want to do an interview series about healing divides because I've never seen our country so polarized. And I felt like, okay, after the election would be a good time to do that. The second thing that happened was I was doing a lot more reading myself and about different types of divides, racial, religious, political, what have you. But I was frustrated because <clears throat> I was reading so many good books about convincing you that's an issue or the history behind how it became an issue or asking you to look inside yourself for your own biases, all really good things. But there was very little written about, okay, what do we do about it? Hmm. So I wanted to focus, you know, again, it was initially just going to be a video interview series on that. But as I started communicating with people about this idea, it was clear, okay, there's a lot of interest in this, mm -hmm. um, a lot of need for this. And so um, I said, okay, let's turn it into a book. Hmm. And let me collect chapters from each one of the people that I'll be doing these interviews with. Yeah. And so I started recruiting folks around Thanksgiving for this. And by Christmas, I was oversubscribed. Wow. In other words, I had more people that had, say, that had said yes to writing a chapter and doing an interview, uh, in particular about their work, you know, um, in, in many cases, because they're, they're about organizations who are actually, you know, doing something practical. Yeah. So I said, okay, well, I'm really onto something here. This, you know, has got a lot of momentum. So I'm going to turn this whole thing into a platform, meaning website, social media, emails, podcasts, as well as the book and the video. So that's kind of how it got started. And, you know, I twisted Adam's arm to say, hey, how would you like to help me do this? And then he was the one that actually pulled the book itself together. So hmm. you want to talk about that, Adam? Yeah, sure. So I met Brian at one of his conferences a couple of years ago uh, back in, uh, in Princeton. And um, afterwards said to him, hey, I'm looking, in, uh, looking at a little side hustle of helping people put their books together um, for publishing on independent platforms like uh, Kindle Direct Publishing or uh, Ingram Spark, those type of things. Um, and just doing it as a side hustle, I'm an amateur graphic designer and, and so forth. And, and so uh, I did a couple of books for clients through Brian. Mm -hmm. And then Brian asked me to help him with this book because um, he knew that I could both edit and design. Um, and so w when we talk about being co-editors, um, I had the easy job and Brian had the hard job. <laughs> the hard job being the pulling all of the pieces together, getting all of the commitments, bringing, you know, saying, okay, it's April 1st, I need, I need your stuff. Yeah. Right? And, and talking to some, you know, some of them being pretty, you know, high profile um, uh, authors, uh, others uh, not being as high profile, but, but being in part of incredible organizations. And then my job was to actually read all of the stuff, uh, edit it, um, so that it, it, it doesn't speak with one voice, because these are obviously, it's a compilation. Yeah. But, you know, trying to synthesize it so that it, it all flows nicely. Um, go back to authors if we needed clarifications about certain certain things. I didn't want to do so much he ed heavy editing that it didn't sound like them by the time we were done. Um, and then after that, all of the edits were done, uh, I did the layout and design um, with feedback from Brian. Um, and that was it, it was great because I actually got to read all of these pieces, and it really blessed me to learn about all these organizations uh, that I had never heard of before that were doing the keyword practical yeah. things. I've done a lot of reading myself, and so much of it is it, it is wonderful, but it's very cognitive. Yeah, uh, and it's it's not necessarily about. And here's the, here's here's a five step process that we've been using for years, and we think it works. And actually, this is funny. I emailed Brian at one point while I was editing. I said, "Hey, Brian, a lot of these are about <laughs> you know the five steps to do this, or the the four reasons that that this works, or this, and it's kind of a lot of the same." And he went, "That's a feature, not a bug." Hmm. Where we're yeah. actually showing multiple paths to to healing divisions and it makes sense that a lot of them are similar but they're coming at them from different different uh angles hmm. uh, and so i think that as you read the different angles i'm sorry or applying them to different types of divides right, right. And, and and so when when you read the book and you go wow a lot of this is about developing relationships or having hard conversations it's not just about having a hard conversation it's and here is our method for having a hard conversation hmm. um, yeah, and that's what's really helpful 
uh, because we can learn so much from each other, but not until we're ready to sit down and actually have that conversation. And too often those conversations happen too soon and people haven't done their own interior work to be ready to listen to each other. Um, and, and so the, this book, I think, helps us to figure out what, what, uh, what the steps are needed before we get to that point. Yeah, that's good. Thanks for sharing that. I, I want to ask this question, and obviously the book is an attempt to answer in the affirmative, but I think the initial question we all have is like, is healing our divides even possible? And I, I thought it was interesting, Adam, you just said there, like, sometimes it's too soon. Sometimes folks aren't ready yet because they haven't done their own work. Um, I mean, obviously the book is an attempt to answer in the affirmative. Yes. But, uh, Brian, any other thoughts kind of on why it is possible? Well, first of all, I mean, it's never going to be possible to heal every single kind of divide that exists. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about you all, but <clears throat> I've never met a person that I agree a hundred percent with on every theological yeah. dimension, yeah. Or every political dimension, right? I mean, we've all got our own different opinions. We all have different sources of information or pieces of information that influence that. So, so it's no way in my <laughs> wildest dream to heal all divides, right? Mm -hmm. The point really is, look at the difference in polarization we've got now versus what we had before. It's terrible. Yeah. And it's in way of getting any kind of things done, whether it's political or any other dimension. And so the whole point of this is just to improve, you know, to try to minimize some and to try to get better understanding and better conversations, as Adam was saying, to help make the world a better place. Yeah. Adam, any other thoughts there? Sure. Again, I, I'm coming at it from the perspective of, of from a theological perspective. And yeah. When I think about healing divides, yes, I do think it's possible. Yes, it's a lot of hard work in order to do it. And you need buy-in uh, from people that there is a divide and that it needs to be bridged. Mm. Uh, but when I look at it from a theological perspective, again, I'm taking it, I'm going back to what do we believe about God and how does God's being, as we understand God, again, as a trinity of persons uh, and as a unity of being, how does that uh, inform our understanding of, of what division even is? Because when we think about the trinity, one of the ways that we could describe that is that the trinity is diversity without division Hmm. and unity without uniformity. Mm -hmm. And so if we're striving for diversity and unity, but not, and, and not division and uniformity, mm -hmm. we, can, we can, I think, move down the path together. Because unity and diversity are not uh, antithetical. They're actually, they go hand in hand, I think. Yeah. Uh, but until we understand diversity in all of its manifestations, as a as again something that is blessed by God from the earliest part of creation you know God is making a, a huge diversity a, a, that's what creation is it's diversity yeah um, once we understand that we can recognize that healing and reconciliation um, are are things that we should be striving for and then we have to figure out okay what are the steps within our own selves in our own uh, communities in our own uh, organizations that allow us to to move forward uh, to heal those divides, and that's hard work. Yeah, and a lot of people are not ready for, not ready to do that. Yeah, well, I think it, it does tie in with what Brian was saying there about, like Brian, you're saying your your attempt isn't to heal or to to bridge everything. Um, if I'm hearing you right, it's like you you want people to be their diverse selves, just to find areas where we can connect and listen to one another. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you y'all kind of alluded to it that this is a big feature in the book is these kind of steps or ways. And that's one thing I want to ask is what uh, are some of the ways or steps that churches and, and leaders can facilitate healing in their communities? Adam, you want to take that first since you're a church leader? <laughs> um, all right. So <laughs> sticking with the book. Um, yeah. There are a couple of great examples in the book that I think lay out some some roadmaps for this. Yeah. And um, because I'm looking at your, your questions here, I'm going to save a couple of them for the next question. But uh, one of them talks about uh, you know dinner church, mm -hmm. where we're actually where we're at, we're coming together uh, over a meal, uh, which again goes back to the earliest days of the faith. Uh, the Christian faith uh, coming together over meals, mm -hmm. um, and when we when we do that, we are 
um, meeting together on common ground already because we're all we're, we're all human we all need to eat um, and uh, one of the things that we can do as um, churches and leaders within churches is recognize that when there is a division usually people are passionate about their particular angle uh, on that division and therefore the conflict that is created over that divide comes from where where people uh, are, are really invested hmm. and if we can if we can celebrate the investment of energy into that conversation before we then get to the part where we're actually arguing hmm. we have we have already taken a first great step and again doing that over over food is a, is a great place to be because then we're already sharing something uh, and and once we understand that we're all invested into in a particular topic we can then perhaps listen to one another and the challenge then comes from hearing something from somebody else that is so completely anathema to your position yeah that you say that, that you that your knee jerk is to say well I can't even be part of this conversation because by being part of it I am tacitly mm -hmm. um, allowing that right. position to be stated right and that's where that's where it gets really tricky yeah and I think that's where a lot of conversations break down I feel like there's something at least from my perspective something somewhat comforting about you know a meal um, where it's like I have the familiarity or discomfort of this food right in front of me, you know, uh, Brian, any thoughts uh, on what churches and leaders can do? Well, one of the things I wanted to be really careful about with this book is not to say, here's the answer. Hmm. Yeah. Here's a single answer. Right? Sure. You know, to everyone's problems. <laughs> I wanted to be able to present a wide variety of different approaches to yeah. this, different organizations to this. And depending on where you are, if you're part of a church or a part of some other organization or just as an individual, I think different ones of these, hopefully, mm -hmm. will relate to you more than others. That's good. So That's good. I just felt like, okay, let's give folks a buffet or whatever you want to use as an analogy. Yeah. And they can choose and say, oh, I really love this. I want to get involved in this. Yeah, that's 100%. good. That, that's exactly what this book, that's why this book is so incredible, I think, is that it doesn't lay out the answer. It lays out, it doesn't lay out an answer. It lays out pathways that people can try on and experiment with to see which one works. I mean, we, when you go to the store to buy new pants, you don't necessarily just buy them off the rack. You go in and try them on and you probably don't try, you don't probably don't buy the first one that you try on. So that's what we're doing with this book. You're going to read it. There's 32 chapters, you know, and hopefully at least one, maybe 10 will really resonate with you. That's been the most painful thing for me about COVID is I can't try and close. And like, <laughs> I have like big hips and man, I just constantly return things, constantly return things. Anyway, let's get back to it. Um, Adam uh, is paying attention to my questions that I sent him in advance. Uh, hey, if you want to skip a couple of these, no <laughs> uh, And one of the questions I was going to ask uh, Adam and Brian is, what are the steps that white people, or even more broadly speaking, people in positions of power, which is most often, at least a lot of times, white people, what are some of these steps that uh, white people often overlook when seeking healing, reconciliation, that kind of thing. Do you want to go first on this one or do you want me to jump in? Sure, sure. So w one of the <clears throat> um, authors who's actually not in the book, Robert P. Jones wrote a book about, you know, Way Too Long, which is a really excellent book. Mm -hmm. and one of the things he talked about in there in this research with PRRI is that so few white people have any kind of a meaningful relationship with a person of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, I mean, maybe they have some casual relationship or some work relationship or what have you, but not the kind of relationship that, you know, you can really talk about difficult topics with. And so how can any of us really learn and understand what it's like to live in someone else's shoes? Mm -hmm. You know, if you have some kind of interaction with them in a meaningful way. So of anything, of all the stuff that's talked about in this book or anywhere else, to me, the one most important starting point is individual relationships. Get to know people mm -hmm. from some of these other whether it's race or whether it's religion or whether it's political or whatever, 
you know, you're never going to be able to have any kind of empathy or cooperation or anything else if you don't really know folks on, quote, unquote, the other side of the fence. Yeah. Adam? Yeah, and I think I, I would jump back one step from what Brian is saying and, and say that the steps, I think the step that gets most overlooked when uh, white people are seeking reconciliation is um, trying to figure out what the motivation is for them for themselves. For so I'll just use myself as an example. Sure. Yeah. Um, if if my motivation for seeking reconciliation is to make myself feel better, yeah, for attempting to reconcile then I'm doing it for the wrong motivation. Yeah. The motivation should be seeking justice and respecting the dignity of all people, whether or not that makes me feel good about myself. Uh, and so one of the things we need to recognize is that when we're dealing with, con when we're in uh, conversations with, uh, around race and racism and trying to become anti-racists, one of the things we need to recognize as white people is how uncomfortable we can become very very quickly yeah because we have not been we have not uh lived in a world where we have to um process anything that has to do with race whereas people of color live in that world 24 7. yeah um and and so uh as a as an as a extra part of that uh that means doing our own work um re uh, relearning our history so that we can uh, understand how we've been taught wrong about the history of the United States, how we've been taught a very uh, whitewashed version of that history. And we can do that through reading, we can do it through watching documentaries, we can do it through, through both fiction and nonfiction reading. Um, and once we have some understanding of that, we can then understand also how power is deployed uh, in in all different kinds of spaces, and there's actually a great chapter in the book that talks about that, and I'm I can't find it uh, right off the top of my head. Um, that talks about how how we understand where the power is in a room, hmm. and and where we where we expect it to be be based on our socialization. Yeah. And so once we're able to once we're able to sort of see that see see the the the, the framework of our society in a way that we might not have seen before doing that work, then I think we might be ready to start actually seeking reconciliation because we're, we're gonna be ready to have the hard conversations we need to have and uh, continue to uncover truths about ourselves and about our communities. Yeah, I'm thinking about, as a student of family systems theory, I'm thinking just about like how so often it's, it's our own anxiety uh, that we're not dealing with and we're just basically trying to dump our anxiety in the other person, and that's obviously sure. not fair. Um, whatever kind of relationship it is um here let's let's give a moment uh let's take let's take some time just to plug some success stories so give me a, sh a chapter or two that's in the book or some organizations in the book that are kind of doing this work really well well that's always difficult it's almost like you know who's your favorite child <laughs> you know because there's so many in this book and there's so many good ones in this book but but i will uh name a couple who i'm you know, obviously really impressed with. One is the Absalom Jones Center for Racial Healing that Catherine Meeks uh, leads. Mm -hmm. That organization has got a great track record of just impacting more and more people along the road to, you know, racial understanding, racial reconciliation, um, racial divides. So that, you know, I, I feel so good about that. <clears throat> There's another probably lesser known organization in the book called Three Practices. And it's basically a series of forums where they bring people together to have the kind of tough conversations that, you know, Adam was talking about. Mm -hmm. It's a secular organization. It's not a religious-based organization. But, um, and there are others that are doing forums like that. The more that can scale and the more that can impact people, um, I just, you know, really hope happens. Uh, it continues to happen. Awesome. <laughs> and then there are two different churches. Mm -hmm. that are in the book that I, I want to highlight. One of them is, um, the, the article is by Rich Taffel, mm -hmm. who is the um, uh, leader of a church in Washington, D.C., Holy City, I think it's called. Yeah, I think I, I think I remember that chapter. But the title is called The Future of Church, Training a New Generation of Leaders Seeking to Bridge the Divide Between Good Intentions 
and lasting social impact. Hmm. And basically, it's at one level a story about how he turned a church that was pretty much just an empty building mm-hmm. into a center for not only church but social entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. Which is like, oh my goodness, you know. I mean, if and not every church can do this, obviously. Yeah, many different things. But what an incredible model, you know. Empower people through business, through you know, um, accomplishing you know things kind of in a secular world, Mm -hmm. and tie it into our faith, right? And have church support that. I mean, that's just I just love that. Yeah. Um, And then one other. I have to give a shout out to Mark Feldmeyer, who's the pastor of St. Andrew's Church in mm-hmm. uh, Ranch, Colorado, right, right outside of Denver. <clears throat> he wrote a book called The House Divided uh, mm-hmm. last year, which I read, which is why I asked him to contribute to this book. Because basically, as a pastor, he took on a ton of these difficult issues and basically preached about them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is a challenging thing for any pastor to do. But his methodology was he tried to find some piece of common ground. What yeah. are you talking about? Racism or poverty or uh, LGBT yep. or immigration or what have you. Let's come to some common, you know, he calls them axioms. But, yeah. You know, some common things we can both agree on. At least, at least that is a starting point for conversation. And, and then, you know, see where we might agree or disagree beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, I know Mark, he's a, had him on and say he's a quote, unquote friend of the pod. <laughs> good, good, good. I, yeah. I really love that book that he wrote. Yeah. Adam, how about you? Yeah. So I just wanted to mention the one that I, I talked about earlier, yeah. uh, which is the better arguments project. Uh, I was also going to mention, uh, the Absalom Jones center, but Brian beat me to it. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah, so this, this is chapter 16 in the book, America doesn't need fewer arguments, it needs less stupid ones, <laughs> which I thought was a great title. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they identify, I mean, and obviously this isn't like only to them, I mean, this is pretty common across, across the spectrum. Yeah. They, they identify the three dimensions of arguing better being history, what historical narratives inform our views, emotion, what emotions do we feel when debating this topic, yeah. and power. How are power dynamics implicit or explicit shaping our argument? And then they also have um, five um, uh, five principles uh, of a better argument, which uh, your listeners can read about if they get the book. Yeah, um, need to get a copy of the book. I really, uh, I, exactly. I'm I'm really glad that they talk about history, emotion, and power. Yeah. Uh, because I think oftentimes we don't take into account the emotions that we're feeling. Yeah. And emotions are just neutral things. They they tell us things about mm-hmm. what's going on inside of us. I, if I get angry, it's not like I meant to get angry. It just happens. And then I can take a step back and say, why am I angry right now? Yeah. What what violation has happened that has made me angry? And if it's a violation of, of the norms that I have imbibed because I'm white, that is a data point for how I am processing a particular conversation. And so I found that chapter very, very helpful while I was editing this book. It's the Better Arguments Project. Yeah. Uh, let me ask Let me ask this kind of, I know we're kind of, I'm trying to be brief for time's sake for, but I want to, I want to ask both these questions still. Uh, so I, I think, I think I'd know probably your answer to this and it probably fits in with what, what you have already said, but I'm curious, like how, how do you, what are some kind of boundaries or or guardrails, I think is sometimes a helpful word. Cause I, I think we'd, we'd all agree. Like at some point you have to have some kind of ground rules to keep folks safe. Uh, what are, what are times that you might need to exclude for the safe to, for the sake of safety, uh, and inclusion? Does that make sense? If a group's existence is based on trying to completely destroy or erase another group's existence, then there is there is no talking to that first group. Hmm. Their whole purpose is to make sure another group of people ceases to be, then that is not that is not a divide. That is a group that is is engaged in a completely uh, other uh, something completely different. Um, so when we're talking about bringing hard, people together for hard conversations, I'm not talking about um, folks that think all Jewish people should be murdered yeah. and then going to talk to Jewish people. That's not what we're talking about. Yeah. 
we might be talking about how various people think about the the two state solution for Israel Palestine, mm -hmm. right? And we can have honest conversations about different differing opinions about what that looks like. But that would be the that would be kind of the the big category of exclusion that I would have um, when I'm if I'm going to facilitate some kind of dialogue. Yeah, Brian, what about you? What are your thoughts? I mean, I think Adam said it very well. I mean, I really don't have much to add to that, I mean, other than you know, err on the side of inclusion when you can. Mm -hmm. But I think every situation is so different. Whether you're talking about the context of a church, or you're talking about the context of a, you know, political discussion, or something else, right? I mean, I think the people that moderate these things have to be really skilled. And yeah. Really yeah. Touch with a particular audience or community or whatever you know that you're talking about there. And you know, it's it's a very nuanced thing. It's not something that you know. This rule will apply equally to everyone. Well, I'm glad you said that about kind of the skilled moderator, because that kind of fits with this last question I was going to ask you. Um, even people, uh, even white people that I very much respect and know that they mean have been doing great work for social justice. I've I've heard stories from them about how they've, you know, quote unquote, stepped in it unintentionally, even trying to do good. Um so I'm guessing you would probably agree, like, it's not best for some pastor, I guess this kind of speaks to anxiety too, to go run out and try to like facilitate like a, 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 a conversation without doing some of their own work. So I, I guess maybe what kind of tips or encouragement perspectives would you have for like a pastor or faith leader? Heck, it could be a community leader, you know, whatever, who's like, hey, I want to, I want to do this kind of work, but you know. What do I need to do first? Well, getting in touch with some of the organizations that are in the book would be a good first step, I think, uh, because it does show that there are processes that uh, can be taught hmm. uh, to help people to facilitate conversations. Also, again, doing your own work ahead of time uh, and continuing to do it that because, you know, say, you know, uh, standing up for for social justice and uh, saying being an anti-racist, that is a lifelong spiritual commitment. Yeah, um, that is not just uh, that is not just uh, being a member of a political party or not. That is not just a social you know stance. It is a spiritual commitment because it does change who you are and hopefully makes you a better Christian because you are you, you know you are um, recognizing the the inherent uh, you know the love of God in all people and seeing all people as children of God. Um, and so there are, you know, thousands of trainings out there to help people um, to facilitate conversations. Just jumping in to have a conversation in order to say I had a conversation yeah. is the wrong place to start. Yeah. Good. Brian, thoughts from you on that? Uh, to totally agree. I mean, uh, again, that was one of the purposes of this book is to, to, to portray role models yeah. for other people to learn from. And, and, you know, reach out to them and contact them and see, you know, either if they could be a mentor or if you could get, you know, involved in their program. Yeah. The only thing I would say is that, you know, the skill set necessary to do this, to lead this kind of thing, not everyone has. Yeah. Yeah. You know, personally, I, I would, I would not even anywhere near attempt to be a moderate. Mm -hmm. sense, because my temperament and my lack of patience would not go well. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's not my skill set. I mean, I believe passionately. Yeah, and I, yeah. That's why I spent all this time and energy to pull this together. But I realize that there are some things I'm good at and some things that I'm not. And I'm not going to try to force fit, you know, where I know that it wouldn't be a good ending. I'll let people who know how to do that well do that well. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, let's take a quick break and we'll come back with some closing questions. All right, we're back with uh, Brian Elaine and Adam Thomas. Uh, we're going to pass on the first question. Um, the P question, but let's let's move on. Uh, theologian or historical Christian figure uh, you'd want to meet or bring back to life, Brian. Well, this would probably sound a little bit strange, but you know, I would love to spend more time with Frederick Beekner when he was younger. Hmm. Um, you know, he's ninety-five years old now. Mm -hmm. You know, he was. You know, the entire time I worked with him, you know, he was you know up there in years, and I never really got to have as much of a you know in-depth conversations with him. As I would have liked, or when he was in his prime, but I have such incredible respect for his wisdom and uh, skills and uh, insights that I would, you know, 
dearly love to be able to spend more time with him. Cool, cool. Uh, Adam, how about you? Uh, I've got two. I've got one who is sort of ancient and one more modern. Mm -hmm. The ancient one is St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, because his book, The the Confessions of St. Augustine, was seminal in my call to ordained ministry. Hmm. Um, The the introspective nature of that book, which is basically one long prayer, yeah, really what started was what started me um, on the path to, to becoming a priest. Um, and I'd love to have a conversation with him, although I think I'd need to brush up on my Latin. <laughs> um, my modern one uh, is Howard Thurman, hands mm-hmm. down. Uh, I, uh, I read Jesus and the Disinherited in seminary. Mm-hmm. And actually, here talking about, we talked about, uh, uh, we talked around white supremacy earlier. Yeah. Um, that's the o- literally the only book by a black person I read in seminary. Wow. Um, which is crazy if you think about uh, the fact that, you know, I didn't read any James Cone, or I have sense, but not during seminary. Um, and Howard Thurman being uh, kind of the grandfather of the civil rights movement, being so seminal in the life of Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, his book, that little tiny book, Jesus and the Disinherited, I would highly recommend to absolutely everybody. It is an incredible book. Uh, and Howard Thurman has a quotation uh, that, that um, really speaks to me and kind of guides my life. He said once, don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and do yeah. it. Because yeah. what the world needs is people who have come alive. And that just really speaks to me. Yeah, I love it. Um, Brian, hopes for the future of Christianity. Well, I hope that <clears throat> collectively we can show more empathy. Hmm. Um, you know, being able to live in other people's shoes and understand their lives, what they've faced. But probably at the end of the day, I just wish we would pay attention to what Jesus said. Hmm. I mean, you know, um, I really love the name of the organization that Shane Claiborne Mm -hmm. started, right? Red Letter Christian. Yeah. Right? You know, let's just go back and pay attention to what he said. Yeah. When he was trying to be a role model for us, right? And I think if we could just do that, We'll come a long ways forward from where we are right now. Yeah. Adam? Because Brian took Jesus' words uh, as his answer, I will go a little more structural. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that uh, where we are right now, at least in in Western Christianity, we are in a, a moment where the church is losing the power of empire mm-hmm. uh, we have we the church has been embroiled with uh the empire since the you know 300s a.d uh and nowadays we are shedding that imperial structure yeah and that's causing uh, you know tons of consternation across the church um and at the same time offers us incredible opportunities to recapture the work of the apostles uh, when they were in that early church, when they were these entrepreneurs of this new faith and were able to go out and, and proclaim the gospel in authentic ways that were not um, contorted by the trappings of empire. And the more we can distance ourselves from that imperial model of the church, the more we actually do get back to the words of Jesus and, and see them for what they really are, uh, which, is, which are words of life and words of, of liberation. Um, and that's my hope for, for Christianity. That's good. Amen. That's good. I like how you tied it in there with Brian's answer. I'm a preacher, Lord. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, Brian, where can people find out more about you? And then, Adam, you can follow. Well, I don't care for them to find anything more about me. That's not necessary. <laughs> what I want them to find out about is this book and all these organizations that we highlight. Yeah. So to do that, just go to howtohealourdivides.com. Just all spelled out, run all together, howtohealourdivides.com. Uh, I'm, uh, well, I, I'll i say that Brian doesn't want people to see him, but I'll, I'll go ahead and go ahead. Go ahead. Websites. <laughs> Um, my first website uh, is wherethewind.com, W-H-E-R-E, thewind.com. I started it the week before I was ordained to the priesthood. And, uh, well, so you've kept that going a long time then. 
Yes, I have. Every single sermon I've ever preached is there. Wow. Uh, so some of them are clunkers, but some of them are okay. <laughs> There's about 350 sermons on that website. And um, so that's where, that's my, my, one of my main websites. I recently started adamthomas.net for my fantasy novels. Uh, people are interested in um, kind of high fantasy uh, books that are written by a pastor. <laughs> Um, they're not churchy or anything, but they've got good themes, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I I also am am a podcaster, Lauren. Uh, I have a a little podcast with a friend of mine, uh, my friend Carrie, and it's called the podcast for nerdy Christians. And we uh, talk at the intersection of nerd, nerddom and, uh, faith and, and talk about Marvel and Star Wars and Disney and, and, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings, all kinds of stuff, uh, to see how those things can, uh, help us be better Christians. I would say, um, yeah. I was going to say I'm a perfect guest because I'm a nerd, but I'm not a nerd in those kind of nerd senses. So, there you go. Hey, well, if you ever want me back to talk about nerdy things with you, I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's uh, you can just get that anywhere podcasts are found. The podcast for nerdy Christians. Well, the book is How to Heal Our Divides: A Practical Guide. Uh, features some great folks like Brian McLaren, Diana Butler Bass. Frank Thomas, Michael Waters, Shane Claiborne, and Parker Palmer. So check it out. Adam and Brian, thanks so much for your time. May God's peace be with you. Thanks so much, Lauren. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us on the Future Christian Podcast. To learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future-christian.com. One more thing before you go. Do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast. And if you're feeling especially generous, leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people about the podcast. The Future Christian Podcast is a production of Torn Curtain Arts and Resonate Media. Our episodes were mixed by Danny Burton, and the production support is provided by Paul Romaglevitt. Thanks, and go in peace. Peace.